Good morning, and thank you for being here for panel two, Heroism and Valor in Today's Battlefield. Today we're going to discuss how does a hero integrate back into life after they return from war? How is it coming home? How are we recognizing and identifying today's heroes? Who are they? Are we recognizing the right people? Are the awards such as the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross, are they a burden to the living recipients? Or are, they, are we recognizing the correct uh, individuals on the battlefield? Most importantly, how are we taking care of our heroes when they come home? Also, I'd like to look at generationally, how are we defining today's heroes versus in the past? And are we, again, um, taking care of them when they come home? Before I introduce the panel, I'd just like to mention um, an experience I had in the last week. Because it's been Veterans Day, I've been on the stage with one of our Navy Cross recipients, Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Workman. And what struck me and what I'd like our panelists to delve into today is Jeremiah tells an extraordinary tale of having been, he was in uh, 2004 in the second battle for Fallujah. And to, he, you would think that having received the Navy Cross, that this would be somebody who uh, felt proudly recognized for his efforts. But Jeremiah tells a very searing tale of how he descended into depression and PTS following the pinning of that Navy Cross on his shoulder. He said every time he looks at it, he sees three dead Marines, his friends, his buddies who didn't make it back. And so it has always struck me that, that as we've moved into this era of recognizing heroes, and there are so many heroes coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, what are we doing to embrace them and help them move to the next phase of their lives? Let me introduce our panel, uh, beginning with General David Perkins to my right. He is a West Point grad, and he assumed his duties as commander of the U.S. Army's training and doctrine um, program out in, in March of this year, TRADOC, as mm -hmm. it's known. Um, he's best known for his th the Thunder Run, leading the Thunder Run into Baghdad. He led the 2nd Brigade of the 3rd ID. They were the first unit to cross the border from Kuwait into Iraq. He received the Silver Star. Um, both his children are in the Army, which I think is a heroic feat. Um, and he is right now the architect of, of the future of the Army, and we'll be discussing with him the human dimension of the Army and how the Army is preparing for these next years. Um, to his right, we have uh, the Honorable Marsha Blackburn, uh, Republican Congressman from Tennessee's 7th District. She's been a member of Congress since 2003. She works closely, very closely, with the families at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And many of you may not know that she hosted, along with Oprah Winfrey, the largest baby shower right. when there was a baby boom at Fort Campbell. Yes, she hosted it with Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> to her right, we have Staff Sergeant Sal Junta. All of you know him as uh, our, the U.S. Army's Medal of Honor recipient for his actions in the Korangal Valley in uh, 2007. The movie Restrepo uh, documented his unit's actions in the Korangal Valley. And he, on November 16, 2010, uh, Staff Sergeant Junta became the first living Medal of Honor recipient in 40 years. And so... <laughs> Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. We also have with us today General Paul Hester. Uh, he retired from the Air Force, and after serving as commander of the Pacific Air Force Command, he commanded 55,000 Air Force personnel over half the globe. Uh, now he is taking the lead at GE. He's the Associate Vice President of GE Aviation, and he'll be talking to us about hiring vets and helping moving, uh, moving these heroes into the workforce. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Pete Hegseth. He is the CEO for Concerned Veterans of America. He was in, he joined the military, the Minnesota National Guard in 2003. He served at the Counterinsurgency Training Center in Kabul, Guantanamo Bay, a uh, Princeton graduate. He was in Baghdad, Samara. He was awarded the Bronze Star. And he is doing so much to explain the needs of this current generation of veterans. So thank you, panel, for being with us here. We're very excited uh, to have you, and we're very honored to have you. Thank you. 
<laughs> so as we get started, I'd just like to start with a question, and we'll go down the line, if we will, about are we taking care of our nation's heroes right now? Um, you know, coming from training and doctrine command, what we do is we think about a lot of things in the Army, and we try to describe how we look at it. And, and this term hero, uh, we don't take lightly, and we actually think about it quite a bit and try to figure out what is it that makes one. Uh, if you're in the automotive industry, you spend a lot of time figuring out how to build a car. Uh, if you're in the construction business, you figure out how to build a house. In the Army, we figure out how to build a hero because that's what we're in the business of. And, you know, the word heroes is, has a Greek origin, which was a warrior society, both Spartan, Spartan and Athens. And a hero is one who, uh, when facing adversity or danger and from a position of weakness, uh, displays a will for self-sacrifice for the betterment of other humanity. So there's multiple components of it. There's in a position of danger, a position of weakness. Interesting you say that. If you look at Sergeant Dunta's award, he was uh, outgunned, uh, a person trying to help another soldier so it could not return fire, so a relative position of weakness, and a, a willful sense of self-sacrifice for somebody else. It's not forced, it's a willful sense of it. And then the title of this is, is Valor and uh, Heroism, but, but Valor is something different. Valor is really the strength of mind and will to face danger and stand firm in the face of it. So you have to possess valor to act in a heroic manner. And so when we take a look at the true heroes as they're, they're coming back, what we're saying is these are people who have met all those requirements from a military point of view, a hero. They have faced danger. They willfully subjected themselves for the betterment of somebody else. And of course, they have the ability, this inner ability, to be valorous in that they can stand firm in the face of danger and adversity. So I would say that's probably not a bad definition to use for the rest of us when we look at these returning people. And so when these returning heroes come back, you say, well, am I willing to willfully create a level of sacrifice for their benefit because they kind of, that's what they displayed. And so a lot of times we look at heroes, we view what they did and what, from our point of view, the definition of is without any understanding that, you know what, that's kind of an example of what we want others to do as well. And so I would just tell folks, if you can kind of keep that in mind, say, am I acting with some of that same type of regard for other people, even if it requires a sacrifice of my own, because that's what they did to become a hero. Thank you. Congressman Blackburn, how are we welcoming home these heroes and how are we failing? Well, and I think that that's a great place to start because one of the things we need to realize is as a community that has a major military post, the way we come around and help them is so vitally important. Our job is to find a need and meet it and fill that need. And that is one of the things that we seek to do. Just as with the military personnel that are here, one of the things that they realize in dealing with these men is that you lead people, but you manage assets. And it, when it comes to dealing with the relationships, leading people is a primary and very important component of that. Now, one of the things, uh, as we look at where we succeed and where we fail, we have to realize that in the use of the word hero, and I'm so pleased that General Perkins defined what a hero is, defined what valor is, and uh, think those through. Because we need to realize that with our language, our language dehumanizes and it superhumanizes. And we look at our filter looks back through the use of those terms. And then you look at the needs of our men and women in uniform who feel like I'm an ordinary person that did an extraordinary thing. And we need to, in our readiness to support them, allow them to be recognized for those extraordinary acts and then support them 
as they deal with the pressures of everyday life. And as members of the community around them, that is something that we look at. We don't want to use language to dehumanize. We don't want to use language to superhumanize. But we want to meet those needs that they have in a very real way. Now, I will tell you, at Fort Campbell, our community there has done an extraordinary job. We look at this on the community side as dealing through uh, the mental health issues. And you've got individuals that are wearing the uniform and serving that can address that better than I. I'm the only civilian, if you will, member of this panel. But what we want to be certain that we, we do is to give them the tools that they need. Fort Campbell has a program called Value of Life. And they work on the PTSD issues. They work on the re-engagement issues. They, are, they look at the total family and how they deal with it. Children who have someone who has been deployed, they have been honored and awarded, and they come back into that community, but they still have an everyday job that they are going to do. So our goal is to be a part of that support system and allow the post leadership to be able to lead those men and women in uniform. Thank you. Staff Sergeant Genta, how do you feel when people call you a hero? It makes me feel awkward. Um, I struggled with it for a long time. It's almost been four years since I've been out of the military, and the fact that someone would call me personally a hero seems inappropriate. Uh, nothing I ever did did I do alone. I did. I followed what someone told me to do, and someone followed me. And we're not talking about them to, to talk about me as an individual, as a hero. I, I, I do not agree. Uh, I've served with heroes. We can be heroes. I am, am no hero. We. General Hester, are we taking care of our nation's heroes? Oh, I think we are taking care of our heroes, and there certainly are a variety of of programs that are recognized by both institutions, individuals, and our congressional leaders uh, to reach out to returning veterans from uh, wars and to bring them back into American society should they decide to leave the military after their service to our nation. So I think there are plenty of opportunities. Uh, one could obviously debate the effectiveness of those, but that is uh, like any organization that stood up and reaches out to do something uh, uh, positive. There's always a way to make it more effective. If I might, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to sit humbly here on this stage next to uh, a real American who uh, did something heroic on the battlefield, recognized that by not only those who are around him, but also then recognized in a larger way with the Medal of Honor, being a Medal of Honor recipient uh, there. I think we should always remember that Americans and each individual has an opportunity virtually at every moment of every day to make decisions. Those decisions are the ones that in the eyes of that person are the right one to make at that moment. If you take the, uh, the person who is making the decision to cross the street uh, in the next 10 minutes or the soldier on the battlefield who makes a decision to come out from behind cover to help his uh, buddy. Those decisions are the same. It's doing the right thing at the right time. On the battlefield, you will remember that the support of the American people is extraordinary. But on the battlefield with the individual soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, it is fighting and supporting the person who's to your left and to your right. And so those decisions that you make are in a much more stressful environment than what most of us envision every day. And thus, uh, it is for those of us who are not in that stress and look at those as heroic actions. And clearly they are through our, through our eyes. We should be very grateful for those who raise their right hand and volunteer for America. If I might continue for just a moment. When those who come back, how to translate what they've done in through our eyes or heroic actions on the battlefield is one of the more challenging pieces in today's environment. How do we take those skills that are about trust, that are about teamwork, and they're about core values that you learn through the various services by the time you uh, train with your squad and get into the, the battle arena? How do you translate those attributes and those values so that they can be used in industry when they want to translate 
and transition back into the corporate world. So if you are a, uh, an executive in one of our industries and you look at someone who has those, who has re repetitiously used those and made decisions with risk and non-risk, and when to use it and when not to use it, and when to support and not to support, and the trust that you have. How can, you know, I'll use a double negative here. How could you not reach out and embrace uh, these kind of people with these kind of values that you do not have to train for, they're already resonant to their core. Why wouldn't you welcome them as they walk in the front door of your organization? My company has uh, reached out and uh, is establishing a program in the defense industry as we build military engines to bring 5,000 uh, veterans into our workplace over the next five years. Now that pales in comparison to the 100,000 that Walmart has said. But we applaud Walmart and the other corporations who are reaching out to do that. And each company has its own unique uh, characteristics it needs to look for, the skills, the training to do so. Clearly, when I walked out of a fighter airplane when I uh, finished my service in the Air Force, I could not have gone to the line to develop and uh, design a jet engine. What in my background? I'm an accountant by uh, graduation. And so consequently, I couldn't do that. But we can find the translation of those skills of Americans who are serving back into corporate America and do it easily. And uh, Jeff M. Elt, our CEO, has a board of advisors that he has to include uh, officers, enlisted, civilians, and wounded warriors, and a Medal of Honor recipient who advises him and our Veterans Committee on how to make that translation and transition possible. So we're excited uh, to be a part of that uh, effort to bring them back and help them transition. Thanks very much. Thank you, General Hester. Pete, should we even be using the word hero, or is it too much of a burden for our veterans? Well, I, I think you need to do, I, I think you need to use it because you need to remind a public that's been very disconnected from it mm -hmm. that there are those who have done something different from the 99% that have not. I think it's important to bestow that. At the same time, understanding what they're dealing with and how they internalize that word is, is really important. Uh, I would say, to add to the general's point, the best reason to hire a veteran is your bottom line, <laughs> uh, is that it's a good business decision. Uh, I think the, the incentive is there because they've got all the ingrained attributes you would want from an employee. So, it, it, and I think that's part of the, the, the sales pitch that veterans need to make. It's not that I want your pity or I want your... Uh, you're, you're, you to sort of do everything you can. It's that I'm an, I'm an asset to you in, what, in the skills that I have and the background that I have in, 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 uh, in experience well beyond my years and, and, a, and an organization that has trained me to be on time, to deliver what I say I'm going to deliver, to uphold values uh, and, to, and to exceed those and take initiative. And, and so I think it's a, it, we oftentimes miss that when we're talking about, well, hire a hero and that's critically important. Hire a hero because it's they're going to be a, a really good employee for you that's going to, that's going to uh, add to your bottom line. I would say part of the reason we miss it, the transition piece right now for veterans is, I don't want to say a struggle, but it, it is, it's creating, there, there is a disconnect right now because the expectation of this generation I think is very different than previous generations in a sense of what they're expecting. Take, for example, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and which you, know, you, don't, you don't just think trans, VA isn't the only component of transitioning, but a lot of veterans... It, from previous generations, older generations, uh, were, were, and rightfully so, grateful for the fact that the government had had a system that was going to provide for them. And that's a good thing. Uh, this generation comes home and says, well, I'm grateful that you're doing that for me, but why do I have to wait three months to find out where my disability claim is and call a 1-800 line and then fax something in and then have to follow up three times? Because I can order a pizza and I can see where, if it's in the oven right now online. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know where my disability claim is. So there's a very different expectation of this generation of what a government should be providing for them or how they should be interacting with that government when they come home. And you see a guy who's been told he's a hero, and then he comes home, and he can't get a, cu a customer service representative on the phone to answer that phone call. And he says, but, but, and that's where when you talk about whether it's veteran suicide or transition or difficult, it's, it's not the VA's fault. It's that that transition is made more difficult by a very opaque process uh, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, empower that veteran. The final thing is, I think the biggest missing attribute for a veteran that comes home is a sense of purpose. You, you're, what you're doing when you're in uniform is, is purposeful. You're intentional about what you're doing. And, and I remember transitioning back from Iraq myself, 
sitting on the couch, uh, you know, wondering uh, in Manhattan, in New York City, as the world goes around, knowing, you know, no one here understands what, what we just went through or why, why we did what we just did. And attaching a sense of purpose to a veteran or giving, and that's why organizations like Mission Continues or Team Rubicon or Red, White, and Blue have been successful, is that they channel that desire to serve something greater than yourself. And I run an organization called Concerned Veterans for America. We're trying to do that same thing for veterans as advocates, whether it's through reforming the Department of Veterans Affairs or a more efficient DOD or our national or, or are spending uh, $17.5 trillion in national debt. That's a problem that triggers things like sequestration. Veterans should have a voice in that conversation. They've seen it, lived it, they got the t-shirt. Uh, channeling them as advocates is, uh, is, is, I think, an important way of keeping, keeping them in the fight. Thank you, Pete. There's been a lot of discussion this week, debate in the military, about the decision of some of the members of the bin Laden raid to come forward and give interviews. There's been a debate that they've broken a code of honor within the community, within the military, by singling themselves out as being responsible for being the ones to kill bin Laden. I'd like to get General Perkins and uh, Staff Sergeant Junta's views on whether they had the right to come forward and give those interviews. Well, I'm not going to sit here and judge of other people, but it is interesting you bring up the word honor. Uh, very interesting that the medal uh, the Sergeant Junta wears is not the Medal of Heroism. It's called the Medal of Honor. Uh, and there's a distinct difference between that. Uh, we talked about our definition of a hero and what acts of heroism involved. And so that's what we use to gauge whether or not somebody performed a heroic act. But we call it the Medal of Honor. Because what we define honor as is a, a, a very high level of re reverence and respect implying deference and yielding to a standard higher than your own out of respect. So what we are saying is if you act honorably, there are standards above you that you defer and yield to. And that's what we want our folks that serve in the military and quite honestly outside the military because as, as they all say, they, nobody, it, it acts very uncomfortable when people, you talk to folks, they say, Folks are a hero. It, it puts, I think, an unreasonable burden on them. They say, I'm, I'm really, I didn't do anything different. Because what they're thinking in their mind is, all I did was act honorably. I deferred and yielded to a standard greater than myself. My squad, my platoon, that was a standard that I acted honorably. And so it is, it is not an accident that he wears the Medal of Honor. Not, it is not a big medal that says hero on it. And so I'll ask everybody any day, and it, you don't have to have a rifle in Afghanistan or be facing extreme danger. Each and every day, are you acting honorably? Are you deferring and yielding to a standard greater than yourself out of reverence? And I would say that's a great standard for everyone to look at day in and day out action. And that's quite honestly why we put people up as examples and, and we, we don't necessarily call it a hero. We say this is a person who acted in a very difficult situation with a sense of a high degree of honor. That's an excellent point. It, it's interesting for me to see this come out uh, from them, uh, from these gentlemen, these silent professionals. Uh, we know what they did, and I can only use my example uh, to explain this. On October 25th, 2007 was my date of action that I would receive this award. My life didn't change, other than I lost two good friends. I stayed in combat until July 29, 2008. No one cares. Just kept on doing what was supposed to be done. My life didn't change drastically until November 16, 2010, when the validation or the recognition of what I had done was made public. Uh, I would never call it a burden. I would call it an awesome responsibility. I think a burden by definition is something that comes off negative. This is not a negative thing. It is an awesome responsibility, take it or leave it, but you got it regardless. Um, I worry about these gentlemen because it does put them in a certain amount of, of danger and scrutiny and there's, I, I think it's a very slippery slope. Um, and I would love to have the whole truth, the full truth and nothing but the truth, but but sometimes we really can't handle all that, nor do we need to know that. And when we say the truth, we don't say it in, in the United States of America. Uh, this is a global community we live in. So what they say and how they describe what happens, personal accounts, uh, war is ever changing. The enemy is learning from these things on how it did happen, how it could happen, and how it might happen again. And they will be more prepared. They will be better prepared off of the full truth that these gentlemen give. And, and I hope... Uh, 
I wish them peace. I think my concern in watching all this is the <laughs> incredible infighting in the community itself and how it's really tearing up our military, this discussion of whether it is appropriate to come forward and reveal details of, of these super secret missions, but also this issue of, um, of it really is dividing the military. Pete, what are we missing here in terms of how are we not caring for these, if you want to call them heroes, who have carried out extraordinary acts and things that the nation should be proud of? On the one hand, we want to celebrate that. On the other hand, uh, they are breaking a code, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm of a mixed mind on this. I, 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 we all long for the days when secret men did secret things that we didn't know about and, and no one talked about it, but we knew it happened. And that has been the Navy SEALs Tier 1 operators for a very long time that, that continue to do that today. Uh, I think in this particular instance, Rob O'Neill, the, the guy who just did the uh, special on Fox News, uh, was probably the last guy to tell his story. <laughs> That's the problem. Is he's sitting there looking at uh, unnamed officials that ran to the New York Times within days of the story to give intimate details of the raid. Uh, he's looking at a vice president who did similar, you know, revealing that it was the SEALs. Uh, a lot of people talked out of school. And this is a community that says we are quiet professionals, but at some point uh, we feel the need to, to, to tell our side of the story too. There is a dynamic of Rob O'Neill was got out with 16 years, he was 16 years into his military career. And that was part of an earlier story that was told about him as well, that here's a guy who, and this is part of a larger conversation I know Washington's going to have in the next couple of months, is how do you deal with pension and benefits and the way men and women transition uh, from the military? Because uh, I, I'm not one who dabbles in the word fairness all that much, but there is a disconnect in fairness when a guy who pulls the trigger to kill bin Laden and does 12 deployments uh, with, with, with the Navy SEALs leaves after 16 years and gets nothing. Uh, but someone who's, and this isn't to take away from anyone's service, but someone who's at the Pentagon for 20 years at a desk job leaves with a generous pension at 20 years. Uh, I think that transition process has to be looked at and recognized. There's ways to, uh, to tier it or vest, I think, that, that a military commission is going to suggest. There's a lot of interest aligned against changing that system, which I understand, and you've got to have an eye toward readiness and retention and all those, those words that are important. But recognize that uh, we're in a different world today where a guy like that shouldn't leave with nothing. And part of that transition process is he's, he's frustrated. He looks at other people writing books, benefiting from those books, telling stories about a raid that he pulled the trigger on, and yet he's the one who's shamed for going out and talking about it. Uh, same thing with, uh, with uh, the gentleman who wrote No Easy Day. So th that community obviously has uh, maybe to hu huddle up a little bit and determine what the rules of the game are here. But, uh, but I understand why these guys are coming forward. And, and as far as what Rob said, you know, he didn't say anything that hadn't already been said. That's right. Congressman Blackburn. Yeah, one of the things that I, I think we have to realize is the interaction of the community at large that is around these men and women. I'm fortunate that my military post uh, plus 31,000 people, and then a community of 90,000 military retiree families that are surrounding them. So they understand the honor, and they appreciate that, and they recognize it, and they allow people that opportunity to share their stories and their work. But what the American people at large, I think, do not realize is that this is not a reality TV show. And this is not a video game, and this is not a, a show or something on TV or a movie that is going to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's all going to transpire within a preset period of time, 30 minutes or an hour and a half or, or whatever. And as uh, individuals retire out and go to communities that are not military retiree heavy communities, I, I think that they uh, miss those opportunities to come back and kind of resettle. And that's where organizations like Pete's and initiatives like General Hester is talking about kind of fill that void. Well, I think what's interesting to me, and, and I'd like to pose this question to the group, is, is it time to look at the issue of 20 years of service? These last 12 years of war have been very different from other 
uh, wartime periods. There are people who have seen more combat, more intense action. Uh, there are the special operators who have been involved in numerous missions, and maybe at year 15, they're feeling burnt out and like they can't go on. Should they really get nothing at the end of that? Should a Medal of Honor recipient like Sal Junta and, uh, and others who have received that honor of late should they, if they aren't in for 20 years, and if, if what they've been through has caused them to say, I need to get out of the military right now, should there not be some sort of a, a pension safety net for those heroes, if you will? General Perkins. I think definitely you have to look at all that. I mean, the world changes very quickly. Uh, uh, the rate of human interaction is increasing exponentially. Lifespans are increasing. I mean, the, the world is very different than it was when a lot of the basis of how we operate the military was established, whether it's procurement processes, pay scales, retirement uh, methods, et cetera, like that. And so I think um, you, I, I would avoid sort of cherry picking certain pieces of a very large intertwined and interrelated uh, process because what happens is you tend to avoid the law of unintended consequences. So I think you really have to look very broadly, but you have to look at it not only with how things are today, but we don't do that that often because it, it takes a lot of effort. We don't change uh, paradigms like that often. So you have to have the self-discipline to be informed by the past, not captive to it, informed by it, but have the ability to look out and say, look, we are going to change a paradigm here. This is probably going to last decades because the one we have is decades. And is the one we're recommending, do we think it has the ability to survive decades out or is this only going to be good for the next year? And so I think there is a tendency to sometimes optimize a large system, which our, in this case our compensation system is for the immediate and try to be forward looking. So I think we have to look at it, but I would avoid, I would advise not to be captive to the here and now, but try to be visionary. But don't you think, you're dealing with the human dimension right. down at TRADOC, don't you think that we could avoid some of these folks falling through the cracks after they leave service uh, if we had a more flexible benefits uh, and the military has not revised that in many, many years. Are yeah. you looking at that right now? Well, we are, and of course, that, you know, it's in partnership with Congress and, and, and all our partners there in Washington that work that. But, you know, the, this transition piece, is, it's actually more than just that. We are looking at, specifically in TRADOC, as we, as soldiers go through their time in the Army, however long it is, there's a lot of things that they do, both experiential and the schooling they go to in TRADOC, that uh, we now can cred credential. And they can either get college credits or credentialing to be truck driver or mechanics or various functional training like that, that then follows them as they come out of the service. So not, are they, not only are they coming out with great values and great worth e ethic and ability to commit to something larger than they are, but they're also coming out with a skill set that has been credentialed that can ease that. So it's not just you know, a retirement check, although that's part of it. It's, it's really equipping them for a life of service, both while they're wearing the uniform and outside of it. Mm. Would anybody else like to pick up on that point? I would just add one quick thing, uh, looking at the families. And what I hear from a lot of the spouses is they would love for their uh, spouse to be able to go into something that does not require them to be deployed. And in addition to just having dwell time, Jennifer, being able to say, okay, if, they've, if they're at 15 years or 20 years, being able to be in some type of role where they are not in that deployment uh, would be excellent. I think many of our colleges and universities, certainly in our district we have, we work with the local university, they have an office on campus. We are doing exactly what General Perkins is talking about in those credentialing of skills and allowing them to get credit in the university setting so that they move forward. But, um, you know, modernizing and looking at how they move through that career path, I think is necessary. Mm -hmm. General Hester, what are you finding is the most difficult uh, transition piece for those that you're hiring. You have a wonderful program at GE Aviation where you're hiring veterans, but what is what do the veterans need to make that transition from the military to the workforce? Well, I think they need a couple of things. One is uh, the definition of what work uh, away from a military setting is like in terms of the corporate and the commercial, commercial world. It is, in fact, a, a transition of pace, focus, 
a focus on a bottom line of a profit as opposed to the bottom line of being military readily to perform any mission on any, any given day. And thus our veterans network inside of GE provides that locale, if you will, inside of a very uh, large company, worldwide company, that provides them a place to go and discuss and, and learn from each other who may have been preceded them by a day, a year, or five years into the company. And that mentorship that you find there is, uh, is, is one of the places that you get that that helps you ease that transition. Just to give you an example, next Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday, our uh, healthcare division of General Electric is holding uh, their healthcare business uh, worldwide veterans uh, uh, organization uh, symposium in Washington, D.C. I'll be speaking to them on Tuesday about sponsorship, mentorship, how you grow people uh, in the business, and how you provide the opportunity for both the business, GE, to think about this, and the individual to think about what are my expectations and how should I realize my growth once I come into si inside of GE, and how fast can I expect to progress alongside those who move straight from either high school training or college into the, uh, the work environment. I think that is a very interesting part of the business. I think there's a lot of focus on that. I'm proud of what we're doing in that area. Great. I'd like to turn to this issue of Sal knows this better than any because you're the first living Medal of Honor recipient um, in 40 years, um, starting in 2010, the president took a decision, this administration took a decision to begin awarding uh, living, those who were living Medal of Honors. And, and during the Bush administration in the first 10 years of the war, there were no living Medal of Honor recipients. General Perkins, why was that decision taken? Was it the right decision? And Sal, how did you feel when you heard that you were going to uh, be given the Medal of Honor? Sorry. Yes, the, Well, the standard, never really changed. Uh, the, in fact, the first uh, recipient was from the division that I was in. It was posthumous, uh, some first class Smith. Um, and it, 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 it wasn't conscious that we were only going to award those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. And this is a very long process, as he talked about it. He fought for a long time after this happened, and it goes through, rightly so. Uh, this is not done often for the right reason. And so, and I actually, I have been a part of uh, boards that, that look at award recommendations when they come through. And we just look very, very uh, intently at all of them, but especially this very highest one. And as I said, we, you know, the definition of willfully um, have a level of self-sacrifice sort of above and beyond and it has to be something for the betterment of others, not just defending yourself for the benefit of for the benefit of others. Many, many times, for logical reasons, that involves making the ultimate sacrifice. That, that, in other words, that's what it took because it was willful sacrifice. So there wasn't a criteria that that is a requirement. It never was a requirement. It's just that all of the things that were sort of parts of the requirements, unfortunately, ultimately led to the ultimate sacrifice. So then I think people just said, look, understand it's not a requirement, so it's not like we're waiving it, and it used to be an requirement. It's just make sure that we haven't made an unofficial requirement and that we look at them very intently. So I, have, just having been a part of the process in doing these awards, it never was a requirement. It wasn't we're gonna only award to people who made the ultimate sacrifice and not. It's just that as they kind of came through, especially in the early years, Unfortunately, that was usually the result of their willful self-sacrifice for the benefit of somebody else generally resulted them in giving their life. So, When I was told what part of the thing with the Medal of Honor is everyone has to say yes to make it happen, but anyone can say no and it has to restart. Uh, and their yes doesn't mean yes, it just means it goes to the next level of someone being able to say yes or no. Uh, I personally believe there are so many more deserving people of the Medal of Honor, of the Silver Star, of, of the Bronze Star, the Flying Cross, all, all, all these awards. Uh, it's part of that of that silent professional. None of us join because we like shiny ribbons and medals and, and having to put together a uniform. We join for a purpose. Um, for me, when I was told I was going to receive the Medal of Honor, it hurt my feelings. I was so angry. I was so upset. 
fact that I did this with everyone and you want to put an award around my neck and, and slap me on the back and tell me congratulations when I didn't do it alone and, and two of my buddies gave every single one of their tomorrow so that I could have it today and you're going to, you're going to put a medal around my neck. Uh, and I struggled with that. And going back to someone who's been there and done that, uh, one of the first people to talk to me was a man named Roger Donlin, who was the first living recipient from Vietnam. And that was the kind of connection we had. He came to me immediately and said, this is probably going to happen. This is more than likely going to happen. This is how I would handle it. There's better ways and worse ways of doing it, but this is what I see for you. Uh, and then he guided me. He gave me purpose, direction, and motivation with, with that tutelage, with that mentorship, uh, which is probably one of the only reasons why I'm here today talking to you, because I, didn't, I don't know how to handle this alone as long as we handle it together. Uh, I, I fear that you can't say the, that the Bush administration didn't want to hand out a Medal of Honor because it goes to the politicians last. And I'll tell you what, I don't see any of the politicians saying no to this. Uh, it's politically great for every side. Uh, it's the military that didn't let them go through. So the administration has nothing to do with it. Um, they'll say yes, I guarantee it. Pete. Are these medals, whether it's the Medal of Honor, other recognitions, are they an albatross for these guys who have served so, and women, men and women who have served so honorably? You know, I, <clears throat> only Sal can answer that question, or, or Dakota Meyer, a friend of mine who I've gotten to know who, who wears it. A living, there's only seven living recipients from Iraq and Afghanistan. Seven. Twelve years of war. Uh, I, I find it hard to believe, looking back historically, that there are only seven living men or women uh, that, that mm. should... Uh, should be bestowed that medal. I, I think we've, for whatever reasons, and I don't know the technical uh, approval process, for whatever reasons, we've applied much higher standards, most of which require giving your life for receiving the Medal of Honor for this conflict than we did for previous conflicts. I'll tell you, Sal Junta wears the Medal of Honor, but he wears it, and when he wears it, I'm proud. I'm proud for my generation of warriors, for everyone who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I, he carries that burden for all of us. But every time there's a ceremony and they put that around the neck of, of a member of our generation, we stand a little bit taller. And, and, and I think having a personification of what that less than 1% did really matters to our generation. I think does put a human face to what so many have done over these last, this last decade of war. So I'd like to see more of them, you know, obviously maintaining a high standard, but more of them giving out, and giving out as a recognition of what so many have done. Have we been too stingy with the uh, recognition of those who have fought in the last 12 years? Me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the hot seat. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I don't mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's an honor to be able to talk about this subject. Um, I, I will come back to the word honor, and that's what we're all expected to live up to. And so I, I have sat many of these boards that select people for promotion, award, awards. I sat on boards that set the standard for awards, et cetera. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sort of right in the middle of that as a senior leader, and, and I embrace it completely. I will tell you, I was on a board recently that we re-looked at some of the criteria for combat awards. And I can tell you in my case, what I did is I went back to the great historians that we have in the Army and said, give me the original criteria for this award. One of them was a combat infantryman's badge in World War II. And what they did was pull out a handwritten document from President Roosevelt. President Roosevelt had a handwritten document that said, this is the nature of this award, et cetera, et cetera, like that. And so I kind of looked at that. And, uh, you know, we've had that now for, for a decade since, and we were reviewing all our combat awards. It was a combat award review board to, to look at the criteria. I said, you know, we, out of a sense of honor, which I already said was deferring and yielding to a standard higher than your own, means a uh, standard higher than your personal opinion. I said, this has been the standard since it's, been, since its inception. And so we have soldiers from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, you know, various other excursions, Iraq, Afghanistan. And so do, do we want to change it? Because if you start changing the standard now, you have to understand it, it reflects back on those that you have issued decades before. And so by saying, well, the world is different, I want to change the standard here, what is that saying to those that have earned it before? And when you say, well, let's go back and look at all the other million people that were submitted the last 50 years and relook all those. So this is not an easy process.
process to go through. So I am in the hot seat. I have sat there very willingly uh, and, and, and take that responsibility. But I can tell you, we do not take it lightly. And we do not look at this through a microscope because at the end of the board, when we come out, what we want to say, we may not be perfect, but we acted honorably. And have you decided to make any changes to those um, recommendations? For some of the awards we looked at, what we did was clarify the standard, especially some of the new ones, to make sure it is in compliance with the original intent of the awards. There also was the issue of whether drone operators, UAV operators, because that is the new face of this uh, current conflict and a new kind of hero, if you will, serving with honor, whether there was any way to recognize them. And there's been some back and forth and controversy over how to recognize those folks. Where do you stand and where does that stand at this point? So we recognize service many different ways. So there's many different ways to recognize service. Uh, understand that everybody that comes in the service now is a volunteer. Now, in, so I can speak on behalf of the Army. Eh, that's the service I'm in. For instance, if you deploy to a combat zone for a certain amount of time in our camouflage uniform, you have your unit patch on the left, and after you've been in combat for a certain amount of time, you can put your unit patch on the right. So that means I was deployed to the combat zone. So that means you were there. You served in combat. That doesn't mean, and so we have recognized that level of service being there. Now, other people did other things that may be above and beyond with regards to active valor, uh, heroic acts acting out of honor, and we recognize those as well. So you have to understand that there's, and, and that no two actions are going to be exactly alike, but you do have to take into account the levels of activity it has nothing to do with you weren't as good a soldier or you, you know, you, you didn't do what was asked of you. It's just, in many cases, the situation did not present itself so that you were able to summon your valor and act historically above and beyond the call of duty. You did your duty. And so you went there, so we give you that patch. If you do something else, not because that person's better or not, because of the situation and bailed it, because that's your job, you get that. But I do tell people, because uh, I do sit in these boards and well, that happened and that happened and this person could have been killed. I said, we don't have a medal titled, I could have been killed medal. <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> there's a lot of things you can do on that. So, so again, our job, and I'll tell you from my point of view as a senior leader, is to people want to talk about, uh, you know, equity uh, across the board. What senior leaders are charged with is equity of the process. Did the award go through the same process as everyone else? Somebody at this level may have downgraded it for whatever reason in chain of command, and this person they upgraded. But what we want to make sure is somebody, because uh, of some loophole or something, they only had to get one person to approve it to get the Medal of Honor, and this person had to get 20 people to approve it. That would not be equitable. So we, we, we are, as senior leaders, we are in charge of making sure it's an equitable process. Not We are not guaranteeing an outcome, because I'll tell you, Every action, and I've looked at thousands of these, they are all somewhat different. There's a unique aspect of it. And so when people go, that person did the same thing and got that award, I said, I doubt it. I doubt it, it's exactly the same. I bet there was a different nuance, there was something different about it. My question is, did they have the same process? Was the same standard used? And maybe the outcome was different. And quite honestly, that's what I focus on. Mm, fascinating. I'd just like to go down the rest of the panel and ask, how generationally has the issue of who we're recognizing as heroes changed from the World War II era, the Vietnam era, to now? Marsha? Um, well, let me add one thing on awards before yes, I please. do that. Uh, one thing we have done in our congressional office, and when Holly Petraeus and David were at uh, Fort Campbell, uh, she and I worked on this. I do a military spouse award, and each brigade is able to nominate and bring a spouse forward every year for extraordinary acts above and beyond what would be the call of duty within their community. And we do this around Mother's Day and it is a great day. Uh, when it comes to who we recognize and how, yes, I do think that the perception of the public is that that has changed. And much of that has to do with societal changes. Uh, public education and some of our veterans groups and organizations are doing a wonderful job 
of helping young people understand who our heroes are and also understand the difference between what they see on screen or on a video game and what is happening in real life. And I appreciate all those efforts. Sal, do you notice a difference between your generation of those who served and those you are meeting who are prior Medal of Honor recipients from prior wars or prior generations of veterans? Uh, the short answer, no. <laughs> uh, out of, out of there's 79 living recipients right now, and not just the recipients of the, the Medal of Honor, but the military in general. Uh, I, one of the first folks that I also had the great opportunity to meet is a man named Walt Ehlers from the beaches in Normandy. And I talked to him, and two totally different scenarios. Our heart, the idea of service, the camaraderie, uh, what we were doing and why we were doing it and how we feel after it was done is exactly the same. He, calls me as, he called me his little brother. He's older than my grandparents. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was exactly the same. And his war was totally different. And yet our ideas and how we, our perception of that was exactly the same. And that's not just, I think the only, the only generation that really does have a little bit of a different perception would be the Vietnam generation and they were treated very differently than everyone else who's ever served in the military and come home from war, and that was disgraceful. But we're working on it, but we can't, we can't fix what was already done. That's in the past. We can only make the future brighter, um, and that would be the only discrepancy. But in the individuals, maybe they, they came back from Vietnam, and they, they tattered their jeans, and they grew their hair out, and they didn't talk about it, whereas I came back from Afghanistan, and they immediately put me on a stage with a microphone in my hand and said, tell stories. Um, that idea of that service and why we did what we did is exactly the same. And that even comes from, from the people who were drafted. The, that, one, that small percent of folks that out of, out of all of our military, they didn't raise their hand. They were just told, go do this, and they did it. But their feelings afterwards stay fairly similar. Thank you. General Hester? Well, I don't enjoy being the person to speak after such an eloquent <laughs> answer. <laughs> to a very difficult subject, and I would applaud that. Uh, we, I, I know we're recording this. Uh, we probably should print that out and put it on the front page of the, uh, there we, the Washington Amen. Post. Amen. Let, let, to just follow that, but also pick up on General Perkins, just a, a comment. Since I'm now long past uh, my service uh, to our nation, uh, I do not uh, want to see that the bar of recognition be lowered. I want to see that the bar is forever shined and that it in fact is clarified uh, as we move through each generation to through each year. Uh, you may not recognize that for every Medal of Honor recipient, there is a, uh, a deference of who offers a salute to Medal of Honor recipients. The sergeant wearing the Medal of Honor no longer offers his salute to an officer. The officer offers his salute to the Medal of Honor recipient. No prouder moment for me as a one star was when I stood at the bottom of the ramp of an airplane and Master Sergeant uh, Roy Benavides came to my base, mm -hmm. Medal of Honor recipient from uh, Vietnam, for me to stand there and offer him the salute as he came down the stairs. It is a true honor. Thanks. Thank you. Pete, thank you. Um, I mean, I would echo what Sal said. Uh, there's, I think every generation looks at the generations before and says, man, I wouldn't have wanted to been in that fight, right? You, <laughs> <laughs> you look back at Vietnam and say, I don't want any part of that, or Korea, or World War II, uh, and then they look at ours and say, well, you know, I wouldn't want that. I think one, one difference of the modern day battlefield, and it's not entirely different, is, is that it is asymmetric, 360, enemies not wearing uniforms, it's not as clear as an enemy machine gun nest, go charge it. And I think in light of that ambiguity of a lot of those environments, sometimes it's more difficult to classify what is or is not uh, heroic or, or justifies a particular, uh, bestowing a particular medal. I, I know that, uh, some things that you have to do in, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan or in that asymmetric environment uh, challenge a risk-averse culture that are in and of themselves sort of heroic or courageous actions in that over time we draw more distinctions over what you can or cannot do on the battlefield, where you can or cannot go, whether you have to wear your reflective belt in the process. 
and, and challenging that and saying we're in a counterinsurgency where we have to be amongst the population and civilians and be willing to expose ourselves to risk in order to create relationships and build rapport is not something you can calculate through a board but requires a great deal of, of, of courage and investment beyond just I'm here, I'm gonna plot my time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it done. So there are some differences in this asymmetric environment, I think from previous ones that were, the lines were a little bit more clearly uh, delineated. There's no doubt that veterans of this, and to, to, to the second point, there's no doubt veterans of our generation are treated immensely differently. The acts of valor are not different. The feelings of why you do it, and for the guy next to you, and for all the impulses that, that, that make you do something are there, but the way that our generation is, has been uh, thanked or welcomed or appreciated is of course appreciated. At the same time, uh, it can, it can, you don't want it to devolve into be, sort of being patronized or saying, you know, patting, them on the, patting the nice veteran on the head and saying, thanks for what you do, now go, go, go sit in the corner. Uh, it, it is, it, you want to be thanked for your service, but you don't want to be looked at like you're a ticking time bomb that, that probably has post-traumatic stress and is likely to explode. We're thankful for what you do, but just be careful. With, that's a stigma, the stigmatization, raising awareness can lead also to stigmatizing. And finding that balance is, is, a, is critical in honoring those that have done so much, but making sure we're not creating a mass perception that that small percentage coming home are damaged goods. And therefore, you got And so programs like Hiring Heroes are, are a critical component of that. Uh, but it's, it's a different challenge that I think in some ways our generation faces. I think that's fascinating, Pete, because there has been this whole issue in the last decade of trying to destigmatize uh, issues like PTS and the, the effect that going to combat has had on um, the military and our society, frankly. Um, so in the process of destigmatizing, have we also stigmatized? Because we're starting to assume that everyone who comes home uh, is suffering in some way and maybe needs to be treated fragilely. And that is also, the, the pendulum will have swung too far if that's the case. I think so, inevitably. And, and raising that awareness is, is important. Uh, it, you know, the, you, what shell shock or whatever syndrome we would have called it before was just called that. Well, that's Uncle Charlie and that's just the way he is, right? And that's, and that's how he managed it. Uh, and you can swing way too far and say every feeling you've got, every impulse you have is just a reaction to a post-traumatic stress disorder that, that you, you just can't manage. And that's why a lot of us call, you know, it, we've transitioned to post-traumatic stress because there's no doubt when I came home from Iraq, I dealt with post-traumatic stress, sitting on my couch, drinking through the day. Uh, that was how I channeled it, uh, but I don't live with a permanent disorder and it was because of different things that we the different things, relationships and others that helped me through that. Uh, so how do you raise awareness within the population of veterans so they get the care they need when they need it without spiking concern amongst the general population? Because I think in some ways we, we haven't quite got that calculation right. And another thought just before we turn to questions, in a way, aren't we placing an undue burden on the entire veteran population by calling everyone heroes, everyone who served. Maybe not everyone who served is a hero. And, and maybe that diminishes uh, the term when we do have people who do deserve special honors like Staff Sergeant Junta, who's here with us today. So just a few thoughts. I'd like to turn to questions from the audience. I'm sure you'd all like to speak, that we're going to bring some microphones up. If you would like to use the microphone, that would be helpful since we're taping this. And just uh, if you have a certain panelist that you'd like to direct your question to, let me know. Otherwise, you can direct it to the panel and we'll, we'll choose. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say that uh, thank the panelists for their insights <clears throat> and uh, our Medal of Honor uh, recipient for its service and everyone else on the panel. Uh, my perspective is a little bit different <clears throat> from what's been discussed. I've been a um, physician in the VA for most of the last 37 years. And most recently, I've been dealing with uh, sleep disorders. <clears throat> and most patients with PTSD have sleep disorders, nightmares, etc. And what I'm concerned about is that we talk about transitioning from the service into the VA or into uh, civilian life. But what we don't really talk about is how do we prevent these things from happening in the first place? Uh, is there a way of recruitment issue? For example, are there certain personalities that are more likely to develop PTSD? Are there ways within the 
combat environment of doing things in a way that will help prevent these types of disorders. Uh, uh, many years ago when I was involved in some uh, hearings related to uh, sleep disorders, the anecdotally it was the sleep deprivation would be a major contributor to uh, PTSD. Yet we know that our combat uh, veterans, our combat uh, soldiers, are often sleep deprived. In fact, in many cases, uh, it's considered uh, that they try and uh, maximize the time that they can be functional. And that may actually contribute. So I think what I'd like to see, and I'll address this to any of the members, uh, the congresswoman or yeah. the generals, uh, or to uh, Mr. Gunt, Sergeant Gunt, Gunta. Uh, do you feel enough's being done in this way? Do you think that uh, there should be more research on this and a way to help not just transition people into society but prevent it, that issue from happening? Excellent question. Right, we start yeah, here. that is a great question. And it is one, Lieutenant General Rojo, who's a certain general of the Army, actually she has personally taken on with a with a huge amount of gusto, and it really is getting, to use a, you know, a kinetic term, left of the bang here. Because a lot of things we've talked about, you know, when the soldiers come back, when they transition, et cetera, uh, that we really have to get more to the prevention aspect of it. And a lot of it is, sir, like you said, it's a cultural, behavioral thing on how we operate. And so uh, the Surgeon General of the Army has now the performance triad, which is nutrition, sleep and exercise. And it's not just once you come back from combat, because there has been, it, as I was going through the Army, it was almost a sign of commitment to, in training, how many days can you go without sleep, et cetera, like that. And, and I would personally see people, just their mental capacity deteriorate day after day. And, and to that point, when I was a division commander in Iraq, uh, just that, that there was that culture, of, okay, sir, you work all day, and then nine o'clock at night, all the planning staff is going to come in and so then we're going to do our planning for the rest of the combat tour here, the real heavy lifting thinking stuff. And I said, why are we doing that at 9 at 10 o'clock at night? Isn't that the most, exp the, the, the most important thing we're doing is planning for the future and you, you want us to come up with these creative, innovative ideas? Why don't we do that at like at 8 in the morning after we've all gone to bed? They really just kind of sat there. Well, then, well, sure, then we're going to waste our day thinking. <laughs> you know, when you'll be out doing stuff, and then at night, you're going to waste your day sleeping. I said, well, let's try it. Uh, so uh, the culture probably is the first thing we have to address. And that, yes. and the way you change culture is the top-down leaders uh, driving that. So I, I, I tip my hat to the Surgeon General as she's going around. You, she, performance, try it everywhere. She'll come see me, sir, how much sleep do you get, et cetera. Because what happens is you build these bad habits, and then they just get exasperated. You know, it gets even worse when you're in combat, et cetera, like that. And then you wonder why, then when you transition out of the military, well, the problem is it's, it's conditioned you that that's how you dealt with hard times. You just stay up all night. So I think it's a key point. Luckily, the Surgeon General, that's like her number one thing. You, you can't go anywhere and she'll be hitting you up with a performance try. I, I hate to go out to lunch with her because she's looking at what I'm eating <laughs> and she asks how much sleep I got and did I do exercise. So it's a great point, sir. Great point. Yes. Um, first of all, PTSD, I've never understood why it's an unexpected reaction. It should be the expected reaction. Any of us that have spent time with our troops at an FOB, it changes you. And we should expect that it is going to change our warriors. And then we should be ready to accommodate that. And uh, at Fort Campbell, we have done some things. There are some enhanced medical screenings. When they do come to Fort Campbell, that has been helpful. Uh, some prescriptive drug use monitoring, which has also been very helpful. Uh, and then we're building an inpatient behavioral health facility there. Uh, something on post, something off post. That is helpful. What I think is most significant, a recent survey that was done on post, 66% of all the enlisted that were surveyed said they thought it was appropriate to seek help when you are needing help for PTSD or emotional or coping issues. And I liked seeing that trend that yes, indeed, this is a part of readiness and it needs to be addressed early, not later. Okay, we have time for about one or two more questions. Rook, Rook, come on, okay. 
Um, my name is Alan Driggers. I'm from Gainesville, Texas. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to meet Sergeant Gunty uh, before. Um, it's very uh, good to see you again. My question really is, we talked about purpose. I am a U.S. Uh, Navy veteran, and we talked about purpose when, when the military uh, leave, the, when we leave the military. One of the things I keep hearing about is the hiring into corporate America. But one of the things I think we're missing, and I think it's a great opportunity because I myself have taken this career path, is in the education system. Our teachers, ex-military as teachers, are a great opportunity. It is so needed in our educational system in our country today, and I've never heard this address anywhere. I'm just curious to know, I know that the education is basically state, you know, it, it starts at the state level, but at the federal level or at the national level, why have there not been any consideration of having some of our veterans coming back getting involved in our school systems, because that is so needed. Yeah. 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 Who would like to address that? Well, I can tell you, the, the Army has a program for that uh, called Troops to Teachers, mm -hmm. uh, specifically because, as you said, sir, there are great attributes and characteristics that our soldiers have that really are in high demand. So through the Troops to Teachers program, our soldiers can get involved in it. And what it does is it addresses some of the challenges, as you say, is this certification piece, because it is state by state by state. So we, uh, the organization has reached out to a lot of states who have uh, basically an accelerated or a, a way to get accreditation for soldiers uh, that maybe doesn't take as long if they didn't go to their state teacher's college, et cetera. So I'm glad you brought that up, because that is an example of where certification for a lot of transition jobs, teachers being one of them, are state-by-state -state, uh, uh, requirement. And so we actually have great, gotten great mem uh, support from the members of Congress, because they, they are obviously very well uh, involved with their state, that they are a great conduit. And in fact, in the Army, Training and Doctrine Command really kind of leads that. And we literally work through with congressional office by congressional office to work through the states to try to get these certifications. But the teachers are a big one because there's a high demand for specifically the talents that soldiers have. There's a high demand and there's a great need. Uh, you know, I spoke to a school assembly, uh, 1,800 kids just last week for Veterans Day. I, I gave us, I, I talked about Dakota Meyer. I, I mentioned his name. I asked the audience how many people there knew his name. Not a single hand went up amongst the students knew the name Dakota Meyer. This is the Justin Bieber, me, me, me culture. And, and more people who have been in the classroom that understand serving something greater than yourself can, heart, can start to help adjust, reorient that mindset. Uh, so it's a fantastic point, something we got to look, look at. Thank you. Sir? Yes, uh, Paul Grossgold. I'm also a, a veteran, but I'm not a combat veteran, and so I stand in awe of our combat veterans. The Congresswoman talked about the importance of language. She talked about things like helping veterans and assisting veterans. But Ms. Lewis, you taught, said on several occasions today, you used the term taking care of veterans and what are we doing to take care of them? And I wonder if that's the right language we should be using if, or if it's not maybe paternalistic or, uh, <laughs> or, or in some sense uh, uh, insulting to, some, to people who have been in combat, who have served and sacrificed, solved problems and then come back to, to hear that they need to be taken care of. So I wonder if anyone can address that in terms of, is that the right language we ought to be using? That's a great point, and perhaps I should have used the word embrace, but let's go to our panel. I would I'll, say what we ahead, want to ahead. do, yeah, uh, and then Pete's, Pete works on this every single day. Uh, from just working with families on post, what we want to do is empower and encourage and find ways to enrich their lives, and that's what we seek to do uh, we also want to help make transition easy for them by having resources available. Uh, General Perkins mentioned troops to teachers. We are working with our university on credit for time served. You know, coming from Tennessee, Loretta Lynn always said, uh, not all learning comes from books, you gotta live a lot. Mm -hmm. And we think <laughs> that there is a lot to be gained by real life experience. and finding a way to uh, honor that service through that credit and credential. I yield. I'd be interested in what Sal has to say too. Veterans don't want to be seen or feel like they're victims. I think you hear that from a lot of, I'm not a victim, don't pity me, I don't want your charity. I just want the same opportunity anybody else would have and the service that I've done be recognized. And that's why things like accreditation are so fundamentally important. I think when we talk about post-traumatic stress, we talk about addressing these issues, that's critically important. And, and I don't diminish any of that. And when I, when I mention my story, of course there are people that 
that manage post-traumatic stress disorder on a daily basis because they've seen the difficult things. I think we need a little pull yourself up by your bootstraps technology too and reinforcing that with veterans who come home saying you've got so much more to give. Your life didn't end when you took the uniform off. You, the country needs what you believe. Get invested in your community, get invested in a cause, get invested in our civic culture, reminding vets that they're a part of the solution, not, not someone to be taken care of for the remainder of their life. And most vets, all vets get that fact. Sometimes you need someone, a superior or someone else, you know, looking you in the eye and reminding you that sometimes, and we've all had those mentors in our life. I'd like to give Sal the last word before we break, because we're almost out of time here. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, let, let me say to that verbiage, the verbiage is everything because it's how we perceive it, but it's not necessarily the truth. We have to explain things in many different ways. Otherwise, it can lead to a lie. Uh, you look at some of the verbiages that we use just in, in combat today. We talk about, can, can women be in, be in combat roles? Heck yeah, and we're not looking at them going into combat roles. They're in combat roles right now. You're a silly goose if you think we have a front line. They're already doing it. Uh, we talk about boots on the ground. When we sent over those advisors, I guarantee they're wearing boots. <laughs> and guess what? They're not just random people we picked off the street. Those are, those are tacticians, professionals in their chosen trade, and they're wearing boots. And we got people standing there on the news saying, we don't want boots on the ground. I, I just heard 300 people. I'm not a great at math, but I'm pretty sure that's 600 <laughs> boots. Let's not get crazy with saying we don't want boots on the ground. And, and the verbiage like... <laughs> <laughs> the, the verbiage of saying to, we need to take care of our veterans is the same thing that can almost be like when a veteran comes back, it can cause them to think of that I'm, I'm entitled to mm -hmm. special care and privilege and someone should be here with the silver platter real quick because I just did a whole bunch of hard stuff. So give me what I want now. And we need to, we need to watch our verbiage every time and we need, we need to call people out when they don't. I hate when someone says a war is winding down. I don't know what that means. I don't know what a winding down war means. Are people still getting shot at? That's called war. Are we still deploying people around the world? That is war. Let's say we're at war. Don't be afraid to say the truth. When we disguise what we mean through, through either misinterpreted verbiage or understood verbiage, it's not the truth anymore. And what people take from that, always, everyone runs a different direction with it. And that's why we need to become united. And that's where we're going to find the answer. And we can understand what everyone else is saying because they're just giving a straight talk, honest truth. Say, we don't need to care for our veterans. We need to acknowledge what they did. We can assist when they need it. We can give them purpose, direction, motivation. We can give them opportunity, but we're not caring for them. We're just treating them as other people because that's what we should do to all people. We should care for every single person in this room, whether they're a veteran or not. We care about people. We care about people around the world. We care for everyone. We don't need to care for these people specifically. We just need to care for them the same as we do everyone else. And we'd be a whole lot better off as a, as a, as a country, as a, like I said, this, this global economy we live in, we'd all be in a great place if everyone cared as much for the person next to them as they cared for themselves. And that's not necessarily this room, but that's a lot of rooms in this, in this world, a lot of places around the world. Amen. I appreciate Thank you. it. And on that note, I'd like to thank you for joining us and thanking our esteemed panelists for joining us today. Thank you very much.